Okay, hello again, Ling341. Uh, today we're going to talk about place of articulation in greater detail than we've ever done so before. Uh, so yeah, just to give you kind of uh, what the, a picture of what the landscape looks like at this point. Up until now, we've been rapidly running through the vocal tract and basically doing a review for English uh, phonetic transcription only. Um, and I've given you sort of the various dimensions of articulation for consonants. But now uh, from here on out, we're gonna go back through the whole process in slow motion, as it were, and we're gonna build up our understanding of how speech sounds are made in the process for all of the languages of the world, focusing basically on one of the dimensions of articulation at a time, um, at least for a, a while until we get to the ability to understand speech acoustically, which as I mentioned in the last lecture, is a um, very useful and helpful way to understand how vowels are produced as well as how to transcribe both consonants and vowels um, when it can be hard to hear the distinctions between segments we're not used to listening to in English or our native language in general. So our goal, <laughs> before I get too far afield, is to understand the mechanics of articulation and phonetics and also understand the basics of acoustic phonetics too with the idea being that we wanna be able to transcribe any sound in any of the languages of the world by the time we're done with the semester. Um, so we want to be able to get from articulation to acoustics. That is how speech sounds are transmitted through the air. Just so you know, as I go through this first lecture, which is just going to focus on all the different places of articulation we can get in all the languages of the world. This and most future lectures will include sound samples from many different languages from around the world. And I've got these links here. I just checked them out um, and actually they still work, uh, which is nice. But most of the sound file examples I got not all of them, but most um, are from this website from the UCLA Phonetics Database. So you can check this out. Uh, it's got a lot of different options uh, or different features that you can kind of listen to. Here's some for place of articulation that we'll listen to today. Um, so on and so forth, tones, et cetera, trills, VOT, so on and so forth. Uh, so if you have uh, whatever, any sort of difficulty for, um, at listening to these sound files in the PowerPoints as I post them. You probably shouldn't have a problem listening to them in the um, <laughs> lecture videos I post, but if you wanna to listen to them again on your own or just get more sound files of the same nature, then you can go to these websites and check them out. Uh, okay, so back to the big picture. The point I wanted to leave you with last time, which I think I did leave you with last time, is that through combinatorics, through combine, combining the various different options of the various different dimensions of articulation, we can make a large number of distinctions out of a very small number of articulatory dimensions. So we basically have seven different dimensions for consonants, and some of them kind of depend on, on the others, but we, we have way more than seven different sounds we can produce in speech, right? Um, and we don't have all the sounds in any one given language, but we can produce a huge number if we start to like tweak all the different features um, and see what kind of combinations we get. But remember, there are gaps in the IPA chart, so not all combinations of gestures are possible and not all combinations of gestures are likely either. Uh, so like I said before, this is not phonology. You can't just sort of do this willy-nilly and see how everything kind of shakes out in a formal way. You actually have to implement these speech gestures in physical reality, uh, and you run into some limitations based on those physical realities, right? So that's, the, <laughs> I normally ask the question why and glad I didn't ask it now, but that's the answer to that question, that the dimensions are not entirely separate from one another. They interact because they're based on physical realities and they're not simply abstract. And we're gonna walk through, as we go through place of articulation today, we're gonna walk through uh, a few of the ways that we get interactions between place of articulation and some of the other um, dimensions or features of articulation for consonants. Um, so one of the ways in which uh, these dimensions can interact is that all speech sounds are gonna involve the flow of air. So today we talk about place of articulation. In the next lecture, I'm gonna talk about airstream mechanisms is sort of the first dimension of articulation that I um, gave you guys in a couple of lectures ago. So we know there has to be some airstream mechanism involved when we produce speech sounds. Normally, for English at least, we have a pulmonic aggressive airstream mechanism. We push air out of the lungs. Uh, but if air doesn't flow, then we get no sound at all, right? Um, yeah, that's what sound consists of, is molecules moving through the air, or at least energy moving through the air molecules around us. So articulation and acoustics are linked through aerodynamics, which is the study of the flow of air. And for our purpose, it's gonna be the study of the flow of air and speech sounds, although of course it can you know, apply to many different things like studying how airplanes fly or birds fly or whatever, right? Um, how does air flow? 
we are not going to sort of, well, in this class, we aren't able to look, sort of develop the sort of technical expertise to really understand aerodynamics at like a fine grained technical level um, or mathematical level for that matter. But we can kind of think about it at least intuitively because um, we all basically have a sense of what air should do in certain situations. Um, so I'll try to walk you through some of those um, as we go through this and with the notion in mind that aerodynamics can limit the combinatorial possibilities of speech because we have to get air flowing um, and we can't do make sounds that don't have air flowing in the way that we want it to. So an exception to this idea that we only have sounds when we have air flowing is this weird kind of um, counter example in the speech sounds of the world. And these sounds are called stops, even though they're not sounds. What they do is they stop the flow of air through the vocal tract or the articulatory tract in general. Uh, so yeah, generally when we speak, air is going to flow out of our mouth. However, when we make a stop, we briefly have a moment where air is not flowing out through our mouth. And we hear that kind of absence of the flow, as it were. Um, how do we do that? You make a tight, an airtight seal between articulators. I give you a lot of examples in the previous lectures, but say if you're making a bilabial stop, buh, you simply close your two lips so that air can't flow out. And buh, for a while, there's no air flowing through your mouth, but I say like, ba 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 whatever. Uh, there are little gaps in the flow of air as I'm speaking, and your mind just kind of figures out how it all works together um, through whatever magical machinery works in our mind to perceive speech. Um, however, the point I want to make is an aerodynamic one. So we're stopping the flow of air as it goes through our vocal tract. We only have to do it for a short amount of time. Are there going to be some places in the articulatory tract where this might be easier to do than others. And I normally ask this in class uh, and I normally hope to get responses and I normally do get responses. So in order to give you a little bit of time to think of a response, um, I will take a break here and drink a bit from my glass of water. <clears throat> Reset the whole vocal folds. Yeah, do you have any answers? What do you think is a good option? Maybe you can think of a good option as being the one I just mentioned, like bilabial stops. It's pretty easy to push your two lips together. So you make an airtight seal there. Ba, Yeah. And you can see that nicely too. Um, I, uh, in, well, traditionally in this class, I have people do um, what is listed here as the tongue experiment. So you can try to sort of um, see where your tongue can go in your mouth uh, to the limits of its, you know, articulatory possibilities, you know, just take your tongue and lick sort of the roof of your mouth and try to see if there's a good spot there somewhere where you can get a nice closure between your tongue and various spots in your vocal tract. Are there some spots there which would work better than others? Um, maybe, uh, maybe you can tell me, I'm not gonna give you a specific answer right now about that, but you can kind of think of it like, um, another way to think about it is like your tongue is like uh, your fingers, if you're playing a guitar and you're kind of searching for like those frets, if you're a guitar player, you know, you press down the strings on the frets uh, or actually not on the frets. You, you, yeah, the frets like enable you to make sort of a closure at a specific spot and you can press down on the strings to sort of get a specific note on your guitar. Uh, and you can kind of think of your tongue as like, you know, your fingers looking for a place to sort of make a nice closure um, to give you a specific sort of note that you're going to play with your articulatory tract. Uh, so I mentioned here on the slide, an easy place to do this without your tongue is between the lips. Um, a difficult place to do this is between the teeth and the lips. So uh, not using your tongue at all, but uh, we have sounds like f and v. Uh, in English, they're labial dental because f, you're curling your lower lip underneath your upper row of teeth. And you can blow air through that nicely to make that fricative sound. You get that turbulence as air goes through that narrow constriction. Um, but try making a nice airtight seal with that same set of articulators. Fa, 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 fa. It's really hard to do it so you completely block the flow of air altogether, right? There's these little gaps, like, you know, you have soft tissue in your lip uh, and it's a hard ridge with your teeth, but there's little gaps in between each teeth, right? So, fa. You can't really get a labiodental stop. And in fact, we don't know of any language which has labiodental stop. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the entire set of stops and their different places of articulation in the lecture today. 
Uh, we'll start here in the front and kind of move back as we go. Uh, this is the um, the row of stops in the various places of articulation as it's listed in the IPA chart. And uh, it has these two stops listed here for the bilabials. It doesn't have anything listed for the labio dentals, but it's not a gray box. So I guess somebody out there still thinks that you could possibly make a labio dental stop. We just haven't found one yet. Um, but for our purposes, for our, from our perspective, one thing that's nice is that we get this set of three for free because we already know these from English, or at least you should know them by now after all these lectures um, reviewing English transcription that we've gone through so far. So we have um, bilabials, we have alveolars, and we have velars. We have them in both voiceless and voiced flavors uh, at each place of articulation. And it turns out these are the three most common places of articulation for stops. So in some respects, yay, we're lucky that we have these three. We know them already, but uh, most languages are like this, it turns out. Uh, there's nothing that special about English in this respect. Um, so I'm going to give you some data uh, that is taken from what's called the UPSID database. Uh, and this is a project that uh, the phonetician Ian Madison worked on a long time ago in the 80s, uh, where he dug through um, grammars of languages and, you know, a library somewhere uh, and surveyed 317 different languages, trying to get uh, um, as wide as possible of a sampling of both, uh, you know, historically related language families and also uh, geographically distinct families or uh, geographically distinct languages throughout the world uh, to sort of hopefully get a sort of universalist sampling of um, what language phonetics looks like. So he took 317 different languages with those criteria in mind and out of those 317 different languages he found that 314 have bilabial stops um, and there's only three ex uh, exceptions to this rule. So there's the Wichita, there's the Hoopa, and there's the Aleut. Um, Wichita is, um, well, you know, there's a town called Wichita, a city called Wichita, Kansas. Uh, so it was spoken in the Central Plains. Aleut is spoken up in the islands of Alaska and Hoopa, I believe is from Northern California. Um, 316, almost every single one had alveolar or dental stops. Uh, and the one counterexample to that was Hawaiian. <laughs> and you probably know where that is spoken. But as far as we know, that's the only language uh, in the world which doesn't have these guys. Uh, and then there's 315 languages which have velar stops. So the two counterexamples of that are Kyrgyz, which is uh, spoken in Central Asia, Asia, and Hupa, again, which I still believe is spoken in Northern California, or that's uh, traditionally where it has been spoken. Uh, yeah, so almost every single language has these three, three places of articulation. So the question is, we know we can make nice closures here with our tongue and our little articulatory fretboard, um, where uh, is the next best option? And this is a diagram showing basically all the various places of articulation that we could think of. Some get glossed over here because there's a bunch of different options in the front of your mouth. Um, but then we go from like post alveolar velar to palatal, to uvular to pharyngeal, epiglottal, glottal. Which one of those do you like best? Take a shot in the dark and let me know. Turns out, the next most popular option amongst the languages in the UPSID database is palatal. Uh, and this one's kind of funny because, you know, with like bil bilabials, it's pretty easy to make that closure. Uh, with the alveolar ridge, you can kind of feel that ridge and say maybe that's a nice spot to, you know, stop the flow of air. There's less of like a landmark at your palate, uh, maybe. Uh, so it's not quite as prevalent of a place of articulation amongst the languages of the world as these other three, but it's a nice place to put your tongue, I guess, when you're speaking, because it's right in the middle. So normally when I do this in class, I write these out on the board, uh, but you can see these symbols as well as I can in the video. So hopefully you'll learn how to write them too, but I do want you to have like a sense of how to write them um, and what they look like when you, or, you know, when you hear them as well. Uh, so the voiceless version for the palatal stops is just this letter C. Uh, and the voiced version kind of looks like a J without a dot at the top, and then it has a line through the middle at the top. Uh, some people look at this and see like an upside down F or like a reversed F sort of, if that helps you remember it, go ahead and work with that. Uh, otherwise, I'll just play you what these sound like as Peter Latifoget says them. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, like I said, I got these sound samples from those databases that are online that you can check out um, if you want to on your own. 
Uh, remember there's a voiceless versus voiced contrast here, but basically what you're trying to do as you produce these is sort of make a stop and like a yod at the same time. You're making a stop in the exact same place that you would make a yod, right? Uh, so yeah, yeah, that sound. Just keep pushing your tongue up a little bit further for higher, a little bit higher uh, to make contact with the roof of your mouth here. Ja, ja, ja. Uh, and then release it after a brief amount of stopping time. Um, and it should sound a little bit like you're making maybe like a K, uh, but with like a ya off glide to it. Ja, 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 or ja, 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 if you want to voice it. The voicing is just something changing down here. Uh, you don't have to worry much about place of articulation for that, but it's either a ja or a ja. A ja, a ja. Something like that. Um, in the upside database, we have 59 languages that have palatal stops. Like I said, there's a pretty precipitous drop off here from the large numbers we got for the other three places of articulation. Um, I've got some examples of palatals versus velars in a language called Nguo, which is spoken in Cameroon. Um, and so, yeah, this is these are two voiceless, or sorry, these are two voiced options for both the palatal and velar stops. Uh, and we can listen to these and you can kind of let me know what you think. Egg. 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 Yeah, so this one is a nice clear guh like we're used to in English. Egg. Uh, and this one maybe sounds a little bit more like an African Egg. than like this guy. Uh, yeah. But they both are a little bit African-y, right? Uh, that's one thing about this particular place of articulation is like it's close to the post-alveolar place of articulation. Um, and I guess for whatever reason, it's if you can't make a nice solid seal there, it's easy to get a fricative on top of your stop. And you might get something like a ja as opposed to ja. Um, I've got some samples here from Hungarian as well, which also has um, palatal stops and also has a palatal nasal. Um, and actually, I'm going to change this a little bit so you can see this better. Like I said, I normally draw these out on the board, um, but with the palatal nasal in Hungarian or wherever it's found, the symbol looks like this. So it's gonna look like an engma. Remember we have on the right-hand side of the symbol and engma, we have this descending loop. Uh, we get the same thing for the palatal, except it's on the left-hand side of the N. Uh, so try not to confuse those because they do look very symbol, similar. Um, try to associate this as sort of like a combination of N and G, uh, where we have the kind of loop down at the bottom for the G on the right-hand side. And this looks like a J here, right? Um, so it's kind of like a combination of an N and a Yod, basically. Uh, so here's Peter Latifugud producing one of these just in phonetics speak. Anya. 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 And I think that one should not be too difficult for you guys to work with. So... It, we get something similar to it in a word like canyon. Nya, nya. Uh, nya. And it should basically sound like a combination of an N and a Yod at the same time. Um, and like I said, I have examples of this from Hungarian in class as well. It's normally fun to just like walk through these and all try to say them as a group. Uh, like I said before, it just always makes you feel less silly when you do it that way. Uh, but I do want you to learn how to say these. Um, that's part of the fun of being in this class and it's part of the usefulness of knowing phonetics too. Okay, so we'll do the initials here first. Duke. Duke. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Something like that. Ocho. 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 Onyo. Onyo. Yeah, it might take you some practice. I'm only going to do it once here to make sure you don't get completely bored, but go over these a few, time, a few times and you should be able to get them um, without too much difficulty. Uh, so one thing you might notice that in the Hungarian spelling system, which is up here, which normally I would say, don't pay any attention to this. Uh, these are spelled with a Y symbol because that's kind of what's happening here. You're kind of combining like the G and the Yod, Y um, sound here. Ojo. Ojo, like that. Okay, our next place of articulation is not necessarily the next most popular one amongst the world's languages, but uh, we're just going to keep going back and back into the vocal tract until we get to the glottal place of articulation, and then we'll go back to the front, which, like I said before, is a little complicated. So our next option we'll look at is the uvular place of articulation. Uh, so the uvular place of articulation is where you make contact with sort of the really far back part of your tongue. 
uh, and this thing called the uvula, which dangles down here uh, at the back of your soft palate or velum. So um, the uvula, you, you can see it. I'm not gonna, you know, try to show you mine, but I'm sure you've probably seen yours at some point when you look in the mirror as a kid, uh, and you're, like you knew there was this little dangly thing there. It looks kind of funny. Uh, so if you never see yours, uh, you might notice or might think that it looks maybe a little bit like a grape because that's where this word comes from. Like uva uh, is the word for grape, grape in Latin, I believe. Um, so uh, that's the sort of etymological connection there. The connection we make in phonetics is that we just have the back of the tongue making a stop closure with this part of the velum so that no air can get through. And the way we represent that in the IPA is that the voiceless version looks like a lowercase q and the voiced version looks like an uppercase, but smaller um, G, 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 way back there. G and G. Um, so if you are a native English speaker, these are going to sound a lot like velars probably because like everything back there just probably sounds like a cut or a G. But you're just going to have to work on pushing your tongue even further back than you normally do for these guys. These are K and G and these would be more like K and G, something like that. It helps if you focus on it. Here's what Peter Latifogan says. Aka. Aka. Aga. Aga. And you don't really need to sound like you're strangling yourself for this one. We're not there yet, but we'll get there. Aga. Aga. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, 47 languages in the episode database have uvular stops. Uh, there's an uvular nasal as well. Unfortunately, I still don't have a good example of this. Um, but it is represented with what looks like a capital N, but it's also kind of squashed a little bit in size. Um, and uh, here's Peter Latifoga trying to produce this with, I don't know how much success. Let me do it this way. Oh, I now I know what's going on. Sorry. Put it here. Yep. Anga. Anga. Yeah, so just, Stick your tongue even further back than you would for a uh, engma, onga, onga, and you should be able to get the uvular. Maybe we'll do it like this for the future. Um, <clears throat> supposedly, uh, Japanese uh, can have this sound uh, in final position. So, a uh, fun fact about Japanese is that the only segments which can appear in the coda position at the end of a syllable or at the end of a word um, are nasals, and there's basically one. Uh, and in some cases, it can be pronounced, I guess, as a uh, uvular nasal, like Nihon, Nihon, uh, something like that, Nihon, um, for the word Jap Japan in Japanese itself. Um, it shouldn't be that hard for me to actually get a sample of somebody uh, producing that, but I don't have it yet. Um, so maybe I'll work on that for a future lecture. In the meantime, I'll say sorry, and we'll move on. Those are the uvulars. Uh, I've got a contrast here as well. Uh, between velar and uvular, in case you're having a hard time hearing that from the language Quechua, which is spoken uh, primarily in Bolivia and Peru, down in the Andes Mountains in South America. Quechua is a fun language. It used to be um, the language of the old Inca Empire, for what that's worth. And this is what it sounds like in the modern day and age. I'll give you samples of uh, the velars first and the uvulars second. Cuyui. Cayu. Um, yeah, uh, and again, it's fun to try to say these as well. I will point out that this guy, it'll be a while before we talk about this again, but it's, um, this one is the palatal lateral. So it's like a, yeah, yeah, a combination of L and Yod, uh, sort of like the palatals we saw a second ago. Uh, but yeah, try to sing along, uh, with this speaker of Quechua. Kuyui. Kuyui. Kayu. Kayu. Kuyui. Kuyui. Kayu. 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 Yeah, that's a little tricky. But one thing that's fun about this as well is that it's easy to hear this aspirated versus unaspirated distinction. Kuyui. Kuyui. That comes through nice. Kayu. Kayu. And clear. Um, and if you listen to this enough, I think you should be able to start to hear the distinction between the velars and uvulars as well. Kuyui. Kayu. Kayu. Okay, like I said, moving further back, we don't really have any pharyngeal stops um, that I know of. Uh, it's kind of hard to make a closure here, uh, and it would, you know, kind of tickle, tickle your throat in, in an uncomfortable way if you did, I guess. But you can go even further back um, and uh, get a closure between your epiglottis 
and the very lower part of your pharynx here. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about glottals as well already, but I'll say a few more things about them too. Uh, so there are no pharyngeal stops, but there is an epiglottal stop. Um, and we've seen the symbol for a glottal stop before as well. Uh, it looks like a question mark without a dot at the bottom and maybe has a little lower um, kind of foundation there. Uh, an epiglottal stop looks very similar, at least the symbol does. Uh, it's the same thing as a glottal stop, but with a line through that lower uh, vertical strike. Um, yeah, so these are not super common as far as I know, uh, but they exist. Uh, and I'll give you an example in a second, but this is Peter Latifoga trying to produce one of these. Uh, 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 and this is the point at which, you know, you can start to think about <laughs> uh, strangling yourself with your own tongue, I guess, because you are making a closure with the root of your tongue, with the epiglottis at this spot way back there. Yeah. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Yeah, it's hard to know exactly if you're getting that right on target. Um, give it your best shot. Uh, I will also give you, um, I think we saw this the other day, but you can see the epiglottis of uh, Stefan Frisch in this video. It's right here. Oil. And this is as he's producing the uh, word oil. So for an epiglottal stop, it would just make contact way back here. Oil. Yeah, and so the epiglottis is there. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but it helps prevent food and drink from going down into your vocal folds and into your lungs when you are eating. Uh, and instead it kind of deflects uh, food so that it goes um, further back into your esophagus, which you can't see here, uh, but uh, that will lead it down into your stomach where it belongs, right? Um, rather than in your lungs where it will choke you to death. Uh, and that's why it's there in general. Uh, you can kind of see it's uh, not that flexible of a structure here, but you can, if you put effort into it, um, make contact between it and the lower part of your pharyngeal wall there. Um, that is not to be confused either symbolically or acoustically with glottal stops, uh, which is just this um, question mark with no dot on the bottom. Uh, and here's what it sounds like as Peter Latifoget says it again. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Uh, so I think you can hear there's a pretty significant difference, even though these are close in space to each other. But uh, you, you are clearly sort of getting your tongue root involved here. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. And here you're just closing your vocal folds for a brief moment in time. Your tongue doesn't have to do anything. Uh, uh. So you're just stopping the flow of air way down here from getting through your vocal folds. Uh, 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 uh. Or like in English, we have this you know, expression, uh-oh. Or if you have you speak English with a particular variety of English, like bull or kitten uh, or oh, no, you didn't, that sort of thing. Um, that's a glottal stop in the middle of those. Uh, uh. Um, yeah, I'll have more to say about these guys later, but you're just stopping the flow of air with your vocal folds and nothing else. Um, here are some epiglottal stops in a language called Dagestan, which is spoken in uh, Russia near the Caspian Sea. Or sorry, this is not Dagestan. <laughs> I wonder what I was thinking. Agul is the name of the language. Dagestan is the region near the Caspian Sea in Russia, in Southern Russia, near the Caucasus Mountains. Um, there's lots of languages there which have lots of consonants, uh, which makes it a fun region to uh, study if you're a phonetician. And this is what epiglottals sound like in that particular language. Ya. Ya. Ya ar. Ya ar. Se. Se. Se er. Se er. Uh, and it's got these trills here at the end. I wouldn't worry about those, but you can give these epiglottals the best shot you can. Yeah. Yeah. Ar. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's not the highest quality recording, but it's the best one I've been able to find for this particular segment. Um, I will ask you a question before we move on. And that is why are there no nasal pharyngeals, epiglottals, or glottals? Can you think of a reason why that might be the case? And if you can't, I might go back to this mid sagittal diagram and just kind of focus on it for a second. But we're basically saying we don't have nasals down in these places of articulation. So it, let's say if we did make an epiglottal stop and we go push the epiglottis back here to make a closure. So air can flow up here and then it gets stopped for a brief amount of time. 
And what is not happening is that it can't go up here, right? It needs to flow through your nose in order for you to make a nasal. But if it stopped down here, it's never gonna make it. Uh, so like when we make an mm or an mm, we're able to stop the flow of air through our mouths for like an M or an N, uh, while air can still flow out through our nose, like mm, uh, that's a nasal stop. Uh, but if I'm making the stop portion of that down here, then air is never going to flow through the nose. So we just don't get those at all. It's aerodynamically impossible. And we can just shade out those boxes on the IPA chart, right? So that's one reason why we don't have that particular particular combination of sounds in the languages of the world. Okay, um, so we're done going all the way to the back end of our vocal tracks. Like I said, I want to come back here to the front and investigate these for a while because it can get kind of complicated and interesting. Uh, there's a lot of different places of articulation you can target here in what's called the coronal region, or these are coronals, coronal consonants, as it were. They're um, consonants produced with the front of your tongue, basically. And that can include a variety of different places of articulation like dental, alveolar, and post-alveolar. Okay, so there are two parameters to consider here. I'll walk you through all the various options, but the first is what's called the active articulator. Remember, this is um, usually some thing on the bottom of your vocal tract that you can move around actively. And in this case, we'll consider both the tongue tip and the tongue blade. So the tip is just a little tip of your tongue right there and the blade is a flat part right behind it. So the tongue tip, since kind of, that's kind of like the point uh, at the end of your tongue, the apex of your tongue, it's called, uh, those sounds are called apical. Um, it's derived from apex, like I said, uh, and the tongue blade, a flat part behind it, those are called laminal sounds. Um, and you can kind of think about that as like when you laminate something, you put like this smooth um, covering over it. Uh, so a laminal sound you're making with kind of this flat part of your tongue blade. Um, not exactly laminating it, but something similar. Uh, then the other part of this equation is what's going on with the passive articulator or target of these active articulations. And there are a lot of different places you can target with this. And these kind of define uh, generally speaking, what we think the place of articulation is. So there is actually the possibility that you can target the upper lip with your tongue, like that, uh, and that would be a lingual labial sound. Uh, we'll get to those at the very end. Uh, but linguo here just means tongue, and labial just means lip. Um, moving further back, we have between the teeth, like interdentals. We've seen those for fricatives. You can do the same thing for stops as well. The upper teeth uh, would be the dental place of articulation. The alveolar ridge is alveolar, and then behind the alveolar ridge is post-alveolar. So we have five different spots we can shoot for. Okay, so coronal stops, regardless of how many different options they have, uh, they're usually gonna be either dental or alveolar, and normally uh, language will pick one or the other um, and just kind of stick with it systematically throughout its phoneme, or you know, coronal inventory, I guess. Uh, so dental stops, sorry, dental stops, are usually produced uh, laminally, uh, or they're usually laminal, which means they're produced with the blade of the tongue. And this is typical in languages French and Spanish. You usually normally get dental stops there. Compare that with alveolar stops, <clears throat> which are apical. And those are the coronals that you get in English. Um, and those are gonna be pronounced with the tip of the tongue. And I'm saying English here, it's possible that you might produce these particular sounds as dentals, just given your own variety of English. Uh, but most English speakers are going to produce them as apical alveolars. Um, there is the possibility of dental versus alveolar contrasts in language. Uh, they're not common, but they do exist. Uh, and I'll give you um, an example here in a second. Uh, but just to make this super clear, this is the mid-sagittal diagram kind of zoomed in on this very front part of the mouth. Uh, this is the apex of the tip of the tongue and right behind it is the sort of lamina or blade of the tongue. And if you make a dental, typically what happens is that you push this blade of the tongue against the upper row of teeth and make contact there. But when you are making an apical alveolar, you just kind of lift the tip of the tongue so it makes contact with this ridge, this little bump here right behind the teeth. Okay. That's how you make these. I want to show you another example of this that we've seen before in this labiodental flap sound, our video. 
So I talked about this before, just focusing on the labia dental flap, uh, which is cool on its own, right? Uh, but if I play this in slow motion, well, I'll do it one more time, but you'll notice there's a, there's a coronal stop there in the middle. It sounds like a T. Um, and I'll slow it down and you can see kind of in here and then also in this view as well, uh, that he's gonna produce the dental, it's a dental coronal basically, and he's producing it with the blade of his tongue. So you should see, yeah, there he goes. So he's making contact with his teeth and that blade of his tongue there for the two part of that. Do, 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 as opposed to two, 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 do, do, do. And yeah, they're gonna sound very similar. To you, if you're a native English speaker, you can see the difference a little bit if you're really focusing on it. Um, but uh, you do get some English speakers producing dental coronals pretty consistently, laminal dental coronals consistently. So uh, you might hear it say in um, uh, sort of Spanish derived varieties of English, like Latino speakers of English uh, will often use dentals. Uh, so often say Jewish speakers uh, from New York City, for whatever reason, will use dentals as well, rather than alveolars. So it sounds more like this, or yeah, not this, uh, that's Minnesota. Uh, but uh, two, uh, one, two, three, four, or something like that, two, uh, hit, something like that, rather than hit or two. Um, and it's subtle and it doesn't mean anything to us sort of linguistically, it means something more to us sociolinguistically, I guess. And that's one way to kind of tease apart your perception of the distinction. Um, yeah, here are some examples of this contrast in a language called Yanyua, which is spoken in Australia, or at least uh, when I got these samples, it was still spoken in Australia. A lot of these languages are unfortunately endangered, if not gone already. Um, but this is a contrast between a laminal dental and an apical alveolar. Um, and I thought I fixed this, but I didn't apparently. Um, so I'm gonna fix this again before I get to the punchline of this slide, which unfortunately I've already revealed. Uh, maybe I'll edit that out, but here is the laminal dental option. And here's the apical alveolar. Um, they're very close. And it's just this segment that we're focusing on. Uh, but I think you can hear this one's a little bit further forward, da, da, as opposed to da, 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 da. And it has kind of a little brighter or clearer sound to it. Yeah, they're very close, but you can make this contrast in language. Um, it's possible. Yanyo is spoken in the Northern Territory of Australia, where there are a lot of indigenous Australian languages. And I'll mention, a, this is the punchline of this slide. Uh, something fun that we find out through this UPSID database and our study of um, Australian languages is that, uh, well, there's a certain distribution of how many stop place contrasts you get in languages. Uh, so like in English, we have three different places of articulation for stops. Uh, so we're kind of in the modal set here, 171 out of 317 total. Uh, there are only two languages that have just two different stop place contrasts. It's rare to have fewer than three. Uh, and then as you go up the scale, it drops off. So there's 103 languages that have four different stop places of articulation. Uh, 35 have five different places of articulation and then six have six, which is a lot. And it turns out that five of these languages are from Australia. Uh, so Australia is kind of funny because um, most or a lot of Australian indigenous languages do not have uh, fricatives for whatever reason, but they do have a lot of stops. And in fact, this particular language, Yanua, which is not in the UPSID database, has um, seven different stop place contrasts. And I'll play them all for you here uh, in a minute. So Australia, lots of stops, not so many fricatives. Who knows why, it's kind of an accident of history as far as we know. Um, I'll give you um, a different place of articulation, um, it's called retroflex stops, which um, I don't know to what extent they're found in Australia, but they're also common in South Asian languages. Uh, and these are stops that are produced in the post alveolar region. Uh, and the way you make them is the same way you make like an er in English. You just curl the tip of your tongue further back, er. But instead of making like an approximate, er, you make a complete stop like da, da, da. So it should sound sort of like, or these stops should sound sort of like um, a combination of T and er, or D and er, depending on whether or not you're voicing them. Um, so I've got some stylized mid-sagittal diagrams here um, based on uh, 
whatever I can't, this is also from the course in, or sorry, sounds of the world's languages um, book. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how they derive these, whether they were doing, uh, whether they were doing these with um, some sort of x-ray evidence or what, but this is what the tongue looks like when you produce these retroflex stops in Hindi, Tamil and Telugu, which are all languages spoken um, uh, in India and I believe Sri Lanka. Uh, so you're basically curling your tongue tip back to this post alveolar um, place of articulation, like da, da. Uh, and here's what happens when Peter Latifoga tries to produce these. Arta, arda. And the nasal. Anna. Um, and hopefully you can see this, it's maybe a little clearer in this representation than in the uh, chart itself. But every single retroflex uh, is gonna look like sort of the corresponding alveolar stop symbol, but it has this little curly Q going over to the right this time, rather than to the left. Uh, so dipping down below the sort of horizontal line that we write these symbols on. Arta. Arta. Arda. Arda. Anna. Anna. Uh, so I don't think these should be too hard to learn how to produce because we do have the retroflex er in English and you just kind of superimpose that on top of um, the relevant stops. Arta. Arta. Arda. Arda. Anna. Anna. And when you're learning how to say these, um, you can, it may help to, um, to pretend that you're saying like Arta, Arta, something where the R and the T are separate from each other, like Arta. Uh, and then eventually you just kind of like get rid of the R by itself, but kind of keep that idea in your head. Uh, so you're not targeting just the er before the T, but you're targeting them at the same time. Arta, Arta. So going from like Arta to Arta, Arta, something like that might help. Okay, yeah. Um, I've got some examples of these from Cindy as well in initial position. They're usually harder to hear in initial position. Um, the vowel context kind of helps you hear that like er part going into it. Um, but we'll play these uh, anyways because Cindy has five different places of articulation, which is pretty cool. So we'll go through the voiced ones first. Ban, dar, dor, dor. Sorry. Jat, gun. Yeah, um, so this also has a retroflex nasal in the middle. I think I'll try to produce these as well. You can sing along at home if you'd like. Ban. Ban. Daru. Daru. Dor. Dor. Jat. Jat. Gun. Gun. Um, something like that. Ban. Ban. Daru. Daru. Tan. Tan. Jat. Jat. Kan. Kan. Okay, so now all the Cindy speakers out there can make fun of me, but that's kind of what you're shooting for. Um, here's an example of a language called Malayalam, um, which has six different place contrasts for nasals, which is pretty cool. Uh, and there are Malayalam speakers around uh, Calgary that I've encountered in this class and elsewhere every once in a while. So if you find one, um, maybe you can have them say these words for you and you can let, you can let me know if you can hear all the differences. Uh, but this, uh, is interesting because it has dental nasals, alveolar nasals, and retroflex nasals, uh, which are all basically cornals in some sense. Um, so see if you can hear the difference between them and also try to say the difference between them. Kammi. Kammi. Panni. Panni. Kanni. Kanni. Um, by the way, we'll go through the other three as well and we'll do the whole thing again too. Uh, these segments are supposed to be longer. They're like geminate segments. So the length has a meaningful distinction in the language. Um, so you're supposed to kind of hold these nasals for a fair amount of time. Come me. Come me like that. Panni. Panni. Kanni. 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 Kungi. Kungi. Um, yeah, so like this distinction is tricky. This is alveolar. Um, Kanni. And this is dental. Panni. You should be able to feel that in your mouth as you're producing these. And I think if you know exactly where you're shooting for and you produce that segment, kanni, kanni, or panni, n, n, you should be able to start to hear the difference between them, but they're very close. Uh, and these guys on the bottom row, again, you kind of think of them like this is a combination of n and er, this is a combination of n and yod, and this is a combination of n and ga, right? Kanni. 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 Kungi. Kungi. Uh, and also I will mention like, just like 
we don't pronounce engma like separate and then ga like it's not kungi something like that um it's not n followed by yod here it's the same thing like both of them together at the same time it's not n followed by er here or whatever here you have to produce them at the same time kanni 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 kungi kungi something like that um yeah so if you uh, find yourself in a position where it's not super easy to hear uh, differences in places of articulation in a language, even though say your consultant might, uh, a language consultant might be insisting that they're, they're there or, you know, perhaps uh, some grammatical textbook has told you that you should be able to hear these distinctions. Um, or if you're just a phonetician and wants to know what's happening inside somebody's mouth when they speak, you can use these techniques, which are called palatography and linguography. Uh, and this is um, a few examples of how this works from a language called Toda, uh, looking at three different places of articulation. So the way this works, and we do this every year in 441, and we're even going to do it this year somehow, who knows, uh, even in our socially distanced world. Uh, but the way this works <coughs> is that you take a mixture of charcoal and olive oil, you kind of mix them together in a little bowl, and then you can take like a Q-tip and put the mixture on a person's tongue as they're about before they're about to say something. So you leave this like black gunk on their tongue, and then you say, "Well, now produce a dental T for me," duh, like that. Um, and then they just say some word with that sound in it, and it, what happens? The black gunk will get left on their palate where they made contact between their tongue and their palate, uh, or their teeth, as the case may be. So in this particular um, articulation, you can see that it was dental because there was contact between the tongue and the teeth. This is alveolar, it's a little bit further uh, further back, sorry, <clears throat> at the alveolar ridge. And then retroflex is even further back than that, like uh, at the post-alveolar place of articulation. Uh, and then the opposite of that is that you can do, um, you can place the black gunk on their palate um, before they speak, and then you see where it gets left on the tongue as they make contact. So this is a laminal articulation for the dental because um, the speaker was using the blade of his tongue, and it's apical for the alveolar using more of the tip. Uh, and then kind of apical, and then also there's also a descriptor of subapical where you use the underside of your, the tip of your tongue, la, uh, like that. Uh, so maybe this is a bit subapical here because he's got the mark left on um, that part of his tongue. Uh, and I guess I'll just mention um, that uh, there are black spots on this guy's teeth here, um, kind of unfortunately, because they actually don't really have anything to do with the, the experiment. Um, there's actually, this Toda is also a S South Asian language and there's kind of a, there's a cultural tradition in that part of the world where they chew uh, something called a betel nut or B-E-T-E-L nut. Uh, and then I guess, you know, leaves marks on your teeth, but at least where most people who are normal would not go looking for them. But we're phoneticians. We want to see what's happening inside your mouth. So tough luck. Anyways, uh, here's Yanua again uh, with its seven different places of articulation. We can just walk through these and you can sing uh, along at home and well again as well. Wordola. Wordola. Um, this also has a retroflex L here. Isn't that fun? Uh, and then the postalveolar D. Wordola. Which is not retroflex. Cocolo. Cocolo. And then kind of a palatal versus velar um, distinction there at the end. I'll go through all seven of them again just so you can marvel at the wonder of them. Wordola. 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 Cocolo. Cool. So that's uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I will also mention uh, there are a couple of other possibilities um, for places of articulation. One is uh, the labial velar combination. So um, these are what are generally known as doubly articulated stops, where you have two different places of articulation in the stop at the same time. Uh, and so we find these a uh, fair amount in African languages. Uh, so here's some examples from a language called the Doma, which is spoken in Nigeria. And the ones we're kind of focusing on here are in the second row. So uh, we have like, rather than just labial stops by themselves or velar stops by themselves, we have a labial velar stop. And I guess you can think of this like the um, labial velar approximate wa, but it's a stop in both places at the same time. So it's a ka and a pa at the same time. And normally, uh, as you hear these and as they're said, 
you kind of hear that cut closure happening first and then the pug kind of releasing after. Um, that's just kind of the way the articulatory system works. Uh, you're trying to get them closed both at the same time, but you can kind of hear your tongue closing before your lips close. And then because your lips are in front of the velum, uh, you hear that release afterwards. I'll stop talking about that for a moment though. And I'll let you just listen to what these sound like. Here's the labials. Abba. Yeah. So I actually think that's a labial velar. Abba. Let's try these. Abba. Abba. So here's just a bilabial. Abba. Here's the labial velar. Abba. Abba. Aga. And then the alveolar aga. Uh, we can listen to the nasals as well. Ama. Ama. Ongaji. Yeah, so uh, like with this one or this one, uh, you should be able to hear the K and the P and the G or the G and the B closure like at the same time. You're not agba, you're agba. Agba. Yeah, so those are labial velars, doubly, doubly articulated stops. Uh, and as promised, you can also make ling lingual labials. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we have the blade of the tongue come out and touch the upper lip. Uh, so I've got uh, some examples here from a language called Venintaut, uh, which is spoken in Vanuatu, uh, which is a small country, island country in the South Pacific. Um, and the way the lingual labials are transcribed is that you use the symbol for an alveolar, and then you put this little kind of flappy bird symbol underneath the alveolar stop sound. Uh, so these are uh, kind of fun. Uh, I'll play them in contrast with the bilabials versus it's not super easy. You got to work on this one versus something like that. Something like that. Maybe if you do it slowly at first, it becomes easier to say it fluently afterwards. But those are lingual labials. And like I said, uh, the lingua just means it's the tongue touching the lips, which is the labial part of it. Um, yeah, and I have another sample here of this sort of thing, not from the South Pacific, but from a video that Darren Flynn once sent me um, involving Britney Spears. So let's give this a look-see. Sorry. That's pretty loud. Let me make it not as loud. Here we go. Get out of the way. Thank you. Okay, so you can do this in English too if you want. Uh, that's a lingual labial. And it's, um, in her particular case, she's doing this on top of an L. Uh, so her L's are at the lingual labial place of articulation, I guess you would say, but they're still lateral, right? So in that case, you put that little diacritic underneath the L symbol um, and you can develop whatever hypotheses you may want about why she might be doing that. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, here is a place con contrast roundup. So most languages have three stop places of articulation, bilabial, velar, and then they make a choice about whether they have dental or alveolar sounds in the middle. Uh, and then if the language has a fourth stop place, it might be palatal, palatal or uvular, generally speaking, but a lot of languages don't. Uh, and then if a language has a fifth stop place of articulation, it would be something like retroflex or maybe labial velar, depending on sort of what part of the world you find yourself in with retroflexes being more common in a place like South Asia and labial velar stops being more common in a place like um, West Africa. Uh, yeah, so that's all I'm gonna say about the places of articulation for now. Um, and next time we'll talk about airstream mechanisms and kind of do a whole worldwide roundup of every single possible airstream mechanism we can use in the languages of the world. So I'm looking forward to that and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys there too. Until then.